So, welcome EGP learners. Um, Gandhi, mm -hmm. what are we talking about today? So, today we're talking about words and language and media sent via electronic format to a designated or multiple recipients, which can vary in length and content and be sent from any electronic device. Ooh, so, Gandhi, this sounds absolutely groundbreaking. Mm -hmm. What is this technology that we're talking about? We're talking about the ultimate amazing technology of email. Ah, okay. Great. I suppose it is a technology. Um, yeah. So anyway, welcome to EGP Learning. Hi guys. Uh, I'm Dr. Andy Foster. And I'm Dr. Sane Gandhi. And you can see our declarations and all that kind of stuff in the show notes. So make sure you check that out, in particular if you want to learn more about what we do and what we're up to. Good. And a shout out to our friends at Health Technology Newspaper mm -hmm. uh, for your daily dose of information about the world of health technology and serving that community. Um, and definitely a shout out to all of our EGP learners and regular listeners and followers. We love all your comments and feedback and love to hear more about it as well. So, Gandhi, so we're talking about email today. Um, mm -hmm. Gandhi, uh, are you a lover or a hater? Do you, do you love email? I loathe email, Andy. I have to admit, I, I feel that it's one of those things that is just bleh at times. Uh, yeah, I suppose I'm, I'm with you on that. I, I'm probably in the hater camp. Maybe mm -hmm. I... Uh, you know, don't hate the players. You mm. know, we're all good people. Just hate the game that yeah. is email. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, email is one of those things that's ubiquitous. It is everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, email was groundbreaking in its time. Mm -hmm. uh, we've now perhaps come to see it uh, as more mundane because it is everywhere and everyone yeah. feels like they've been using it for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one of those mediums of communication that's sort of becoming almost universally loathed. It's very rare that you find an email lover, I must mm -hmm. admit. True. Good. So, and I suppose one of those things that as a clinician, email, I find particularly frustrating. Um, I suppose there's a few reasons for that. Um, mm -hmm. Gandhi, what, you said you hated email. Why do you hate email? Um, so it's like you said, I think it's become ubiquitous in the work that we do and the way that we use it. And I think um, people can use email really effectively. And the majority, unfortunately, of people who don't and therefore that makes it even more of a challenge and more of a problem to navigate the whole construct that and the fact that i think that the way people want to use email and the way that you can use email are two different things as well yeah it's a very open-ended platform isn't it you can use very it for much so, yeah. all things good or evil um like any tool <laughs> like any, yeah, any invention yeah uh, or science mm -hmm. uh yeah one of the things that particularly annoys me gandhi about email is um as a clinician there's already so many ways that mm -hmm. people can uh, contact me that people can give me work to do. Yeah. I've got my pathology inbox, my correspondence inbox, my system one tasks. I've got yeah. my list of uh, people that I'm seeing or calling today. And and in the recent past, I didn't need to worry too much about email because not that much came my way professionally yeah. in the form of email. Obviously, I was receiving you know updates and people would contact me via email, mm -hmm. but it wasn't a great volume. But that feels like it's changed recently and email has just become another way that people can give me work in an invisible inbox Very much somewhere. so. And I think that whole fire and forget method of use of email is one of the challenging things that people assume that once they've sent you an email, that's you updated. You, yes. You've you read it, you you understand it completely, there's no issues and therefore it's dealt with. And actually we know that's not true. Absolutely. So um, even though email is something that is old, we might not even think about it when we think about technology, mm. uh, we thought it was worth giving some uh, some space to, some time to, and that people out there should perhaps give some thought to how they manage their email because Definitely. they can perhaps feel a lot better and be a lot more productive. And on top of that, we're going to give you some hints and tips to try and make that whole process a hell of a lot easier for you. So hopefully you'll find this episode really effective and useful. As always, guys, if you want to let us know, uh, comments and stuff via social media twitter facebook instagram linkedin all that kind of stuff etc etc yeah and definitely subscribe so you get all of our content straight away at first and foremost let's get to the important bit though so andy email email so i guess uh, in order to um suggest some solutions and mm -hmm. some remedies and some treatments i suppose we first need to understand the problem and identify the problems so let's talk really quickly about why email is frustrating okay so gandhi Top of the list for you. Top of the list has to be overload. Absolute info overload that we get from when we use email because so many people send you different things and you get so many updates through email. You know, when you log onto a website nowadays, first thing they want from you is your email address. You know, when you go to an event, what they want from you is your email address. Yeah, yeah. and there's nothing as demoralizing as uh, a huge inbox and yeah. you know, not knowing how you're going to get through everything. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think for me, an issue I have is um, obviously 
it takes time to deal with email. Yeah. Um, and it can take a long, a long time to deal deal with email. And mm. something that frustrates me is so as a clinician traditionally, uh, mm. I, you know, I see my role as sitting with patients and dealing with patients and maybe dealing with that, you know, admin that goes along with patients like correspondence and results. Yeah. Um, I think traditionally there hasn't been space in the doctor's day to deal with a great deal of email. And increasingly, mm. I think we're being asked to do that. So I have a little issue about that. And that perhaps other people's type, people who work more traditional office jobs that have always dealt with mm. corresponding with people, um, it's more of a natural fit for their role. So I think it's a particular challenge and issue for clinicians. Yeah, so it's definitely recognising that communication methods is part of our role, whether that's with the patient, but also with the people around the patient. And, you know, MDT meetings is a great example, you know, yeah. MCCGs and commissioning and all that stuff. Definitely in our roles as PCN directors, oh my yeah. God, email is... Yes, that's one of the big challenges. And that's actually what's motivated me to have a conversation with you about email today. Definitely. Mainly, because email has really changed since I've become a primary care network. Mm director um there's just so much of it and i suppose the next point i was going to mention was email anxiety just Mm -hmm. worrying what's in your inbox and i suppose um prior to becoming a primary care network director um i could sort of be assured that you know what's in my inbox was similar to what's in my practice manager's inbox in Mm -hmm. terms of what needs to be done for the practice which was my main (laughs) my main work um so i could sort of think well actually if i if i don't respond or you know i'm not necessarily Mm -hmm. on top of this at least my practice manager is, but now you know I'm I'm not the man, but it feels that way in terms of being yeah. you know clinical director of primary care network. And if I don't know what's in my inbox in that role, there isn't a practice manager there to help me. So exactly. I've got increased anxiety about um, being on top of email now. Yeah, and I think it's a growing challenge as well. You know, there, there are even you know lots of articles and stuff out there that deal with the concept that trying to approach your email makes people so anxious that they just physically don't do it anymore exactly and then that causes the problem then. of you know they've not been updated they've not had information yeah you know, all this kind of stuff that we're going to talk about in more detail yeah. another thing go for it that i've seen and i've watched this happen on emails yeah. be- between clinicians or people involved in healthcare as well as in other environments mm-hmm. um people have a problem with um using email in a way so problems arise that don't arise when people talk face to face or in meetings yeah and sometimes if people are using email to discuss something that's a little bit controversial mm-hmm. um then you sometimes see these email um conversations that sort of spiral out of control people yep. aren't reading each other's tone Definitely. things escalate rather than de-escalate there's a whole bunch of people cc'd in mm. who, are, who, are com- who are just watching some other people have a heated discussion uh, it can be entertaining, but it can also be a little bit destructive and, uh, and counterproductive. So, so there's something around people just using it wrong for the wrong yeah, reasons. Well, definitely. Um, I mean, there's this issue of faceless communication and the way that people approach it. We see that with social media. And, you know, that's an, always a massive challenge that people experience with that because you you don't have the person in front of you, so you don't get the feedback. And therefore, your tone, the way you approach it may be completely different. And it also feeds into my pet hate about email and the main reason I hate email and that's when people try and use it as a discussion tool. Because in, in reality, email is not designed to be used for discussions. So when you have the massive reply all, let's talk about how we fix this problem via email. So to then go find out all the previous comments, you have to scroll through this list and it's segmented and, and then you've got you know other sections to it. And it, it's just a nightmare trying to just pick out the pertinent and relevant pieces of information but more importantly trying to keep track of it all as well because you can get like you said tangents forming with people and their views you can get different discussions forming different email threads now as well Mm. that come from one and it just just doesn't work it gets complicated Mm. and my final my final sort of pet hate is uh email can be quite intrusive so Mm. uh, particularly without mobile devices uh you could be receiving emails i don't know Actually, I'm sometimes the culprit, but sending emails at, at unsolicited times of the day yep. um, can be really intrusive and create a, a culture in the workplace that means people sort of feel that they need to be always involved or replying. And, yeah. and, and that's not great. So I don't like that about emails. So lots of reasons to yeah. hate emails. Definitely agree with that. I'm mindful of the fact that one of my practice partners mentioned to me, Gandhi, you sent that email at a completely inappropriate time. I didn't check it. I'm like. Yeah, I can see why that was the case. And in actual fact, I only sent it because I happened to be up at that time because mm. my daughter had woken up. So I was like, couldn't get back to sleep and I thought I'll do some work. It was like one o'clock in the morning and clearly 
she was right actually you know mm-hmm. um you know and recognizing that actually that's not a good way to to do things mm-hmm. um so that's also led to some of the tips that we're going to talk about and the changes that i know i've made in terms of dealing with email and some of the stuff you've done yeah as well. i made some changes recently with the new roles definitely um, yeah. so we've talked about the problems we're going to try and talk about the solutions and how you can improve your email nirvana shall we say <laughs> oh that's nice that's good Cool. So what are we dealing with, Andy? Uh, so we try to break it down. Systematic. Yeah. We're clinicians. We like systems. Um, first of all, Gandhi, I'd like to talk to you about some basic principles. Sure. Um, so these are some time management organizational principles, mm-hmm. but I think they're really pertinent to um, to email. So the first one, and in fact, these are three Ps. So yeah. Parkinson's law. So, so Gandhi, what's Parkinson's law? Parkinson's law basically states that any task or activity you have will expand to fill the amount of time you give to that task. So, um, you know, no matter what you're doing, it will fill it up. And we see this in terms of patient workflow. So no matter how many appointments you may offer, you always fill them, you know, it'll expand. And it's the same when you're doing tasks, you know, however much time you say, I'm going to give it to do this, it will naturally fill. And you'll see this because if you have a deadline for an essay that has been three weeks, well, it won't take you three weeks. Most people will get it done in the last two or three days. And actually, it only takes you two or three days. It may even take you less time than that. So any task you have will always take you less time than you think it will take. So making sure you're sensible and allotting appropriate time frames to a task just means that you'll work more effectively. So what does this look like for, for email then, Gandhi? So the best way I would recommend that, that people do this is using a concept called batching. So you just simply allot a set amount of time per day and this is when I'm going to do my emails. Now, it can be once a day, that can be twice a day. It clearly depends on the volume and the type of stuff that you're getting. But you only have those touch points when you're going into your email account. And by doing that, it sets up a couple of different principles. Number one, mm-hmm. you've got a focus time frame for when you're actually doing the work. So making sure you're getting it done in that time. Number two, and this is quite useful as well, it actually sends an indicative information to other people that these are the only times you're actually going to catch me. So I'm not going to then start responding at midnight. I'm not going to respond the moment I get your email. I'm going to respond at a particular time. And that sets good principles in terms of the way that you interact with other people as well. Yeah, I'm on board with that. Yeah. That's and another good. little tip I've figured out lately is also never do it in the morning. Oh, uh, Okay. That's when I've started to, to yeah. try and batch my email. Why, so the, why, why not, Gandhi? So the reason is because of what other people do. Yeah. So most people get up. And look at their emails. They'll look at their phones, they'll look at whatever device they're on. The first thing they do is they check their emails and then they deal with them and send them off to you. And then actually your contact that you've had has missed that boat. So then you're, it's a bit of a time lag. Whereas if you do it a little bit later, you've got all the information that you need and then you can respond to that and it just nudges on. Now clearly that only works if everybody else is doing the exact opposite to you. (laughs) But at the moment... It really works. Are. You need yeah. to be shift, be responsive, yeah. get, get get the correct slot. Yeah. Um, so another another tip is um, which get related to batching. Really, there's mm-hmm. this uh, Pomodoro principle, isn't there? Sure. Or or technique, mm-hmm. um, and uh, this is where you create artificial time pressure. Yeah. So you mentioned the essay. So you mm-hmm. know, I've been guilty of of the, doing the essay. Mm-hmm. You know, at the last minute, the last few days, the last day. Uh, but actually, in that last day you can be incredibly productive because of the amount of focus you have because of the impending yep. deadline. So Pomodoro principle, um, related to the word pomegranate, isn't it? Or something. Something like that, uh, yeah. Yeah, anyway, set a timer. Uh, Pomodoro principle, 25-minute dashes or bursts of focus with mm. five-minute breaks. Mm. And apparently, that's the optimal ratio uh, to keep you focused. Mm-hmm. Um, and after you've done your 25 minutes, you can have your break or you can go and do something else. Sure. Um, and, and definitely another tip for that, have an actual timer for that. Mm. So, you know, a physical object that goes bing, 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 kitchen timer. You can actually buy Pomodoro timers that are set to go 25 and 5 minute slots. And the principle being you do it in batches of that typically. So, you, you know, you have three or five batches of 25 minutes with five minute break and you designate particular tasks in those 25 minute blocks. So one of those could be deal with your emails. Another one could be deal with your pathology. Another one could be see patients. Mm. It just leads to more optimal working. I know. Yeah, I agree. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've got a little, uh, I do have a little egg timer mm-hmm. that I use my Pomodoro timer. Um, so there's one final P, where there's three Ps. So we've any? dealt with Parkinson's law, we've dealt with Pomodoro timers, and now we're going to deal with the Pareto principle. So what's that, Andy? Uh, so it's this 80-20 rule that you might mm-hmm. have heard of, and apparently this applies almost university to all sorts of tasks. And yep. that is um, 20% 
of your people deal uh, produce you know um, require eighty percent of your time to deal yeah. with. So we can sometimes see that in the patients on our list. You know, eighty percent mm. of people maybe never come. Twenty percent of people they're perhaps using eighty percent of the appointments because they've got a higher level of need. Mm. Uh, but it applies to all sorts of things that require effort or input. And with relation to email, we would say actually eighty percent of your email uh, it perhaps just needs filing, deleting, a really quick reply. Yes, yeah. I can make it. No, I can't. Um, but it doesn't produce much impact. So, no. you know, you need to do it, but, you know, however long you spend on it, it's not going to change the outcome. So no. just deal with those. 20% of your email, it might require a little bit more effort. Mm -hmm. And you'll have more time to do that and get the impact that comes from those, you know, more impactful emails mm -hmm. by dealing with the others quickly and focusing more of your time on the more important emails. So that's the Pareto principle. Yeah. And we're going to talk about how you can use that Pareto principle in a little bit more detail. And one of the most classical ways and the big kind of business way of doing this is get things done or inbox zero, as many yeah. other people probably know about it. So let's talk about getting organized. Yeah. So there's some basic principles, but we need to get organized. Mm -hmm. um, so again, yeah, so some things that float around with email is inbox zero. There's yep. David Allen's getting to done principle. Mm -hmm. um, what, what do you think about these? I, I think they work depending on the type of person you are. So, mm -hmm. so one of the ones I talk about to a lot of people is the two different principles. So number one is the two minute rule and mm -hmm. number two is the three frogs principle. Okay. So three frogs principle is very simply if you had to eat three frogs, yeah, your life mm -hmm. absolutely depended on it. You cannot do anything, but you have to eat these three frogs. In reality, which is the first one you're going to go for? Uh, I'm going to go for the most tasty frog candy because yeah. uh, I like short term uh, payoffs <laughs> unfortunately Andy you'd be wrong the oh. whole principle of three frogs is you deal with the biggest fattest ugliest one and the reason being if you've got that one down the other two are a doddle after that you've already dealt with the hardest thing possible yeah yep so and it's in terms of this is we're dealing with email it's the same principle you deal with that really hard complicated one first because once you've got that done everything else is just easier after yeah, that. That's true. You feel a little bit more relaxed. Yeah. There's, a, there's a weight off your mind. And the worst part then is actually to do all the easier and middle complicated stuff, get a little bit worn down by it, and then deal with that big thing. Oh, that makes it so much harder, doesn't it? You know, think about it as a run. You know, if you were doing a, a run, would you rather do the first, you know, 4K out of a 5K run and then that last K, which is an uphill struggle, finish on that? Or would you rather do it the other way around, you know? Same principle, really. Yeah. How about getting warmed up with a few? Because I'd, I'd, like, I'd take the hill in the middle, Gandhi. So how about getting warm, warmed up with some smaller frog, frogs first? Um, I, I guess you could try that. Yeah. But the whole idea being, if you get the biggest, hardest one done, everything's easier yeah, after that a, point. Get that done near the beginning. Definitely. So that's three frogs. Yeah. Two minutes is kind of how it sounds. Anything you can deal with in under two minutes, you deal with it. There and then, don't come back to it. You know, you just finish it off, complete it. If it's going to take you realistically more than two minutes to deal with, then you come back to it another time so you can spend a bit more dedicated time. And it may work with what you're saying, Andy, about mm. doing some minor stuff first and then getting to the more meatier things just to get you into the flow. I can yeah. definitely see that yeah. working. You know, so as you're going down that list, you just deal with the quick, you know, yes, no, delete kind of things. Yeah. Um, and then you come to the more complicated ones straight after that. So you're in that mindset of dealing with it. And it's like yeah. when you do pathology results as well, isn't it? Filing the easy ones are dead easy, yeah. but then those ones you have to think about, mm, what does that raised platelet potentially mean? Yeah. You know, what, what does that potassium of 5.4 mean that I have to do? Same principle with emails, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so a big part of, uh, say, uh, some of the Inbox Zero systems and some of the apps that I've used in the past is mm -hmm. this concept of um, scheduling for later. Yeah. It's something that I've got mixed feelings about mm -hmm. in a way. So it's that option where you can uh, you know, swipe to the left and you can... Um, I don't want to deal with it now. Mm -hmm. It needs dealing with. Uh, what I'll do is I'll schedule for the weekend or for next Monday. Mm -hmm. um, I find it useful, but you can do it too much. You can yeah. almost create a, a little a little tidal wave of things that you're pushing forwards so that you'll eventually need to deal with. And True. eventually you do. Um, so I... I tend to use those functions, but mm -hmm. try and be very disciplined about it and just use it for when I physically can't deal with something sure. um, to push it forward. So what, what's your thought on scheduling? So again, I think it works depending on the type of person you are and also the yeah. time that you're allocating to the tasks that you're doing. So if, you, if you're setting yourself up to have regular slots where you're doing something and then you've got a bigger slot where you can spend more time on it, it will work really, really well, I think, because... 
for an our example being PCN directors and emails. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to use this one repeatedly throughout this mm-hmm. discussion. Um, my PCN day is Fridays. That's the day I dedicate to dealing with all the PCN stuff, and I make that very clear to everyone I come across and work mm-hmm. with. But the reality is, NHS is an, an infinite beast that will come to you at 24/7. Mm-hmm. So there are important emails that may come on a Monday, and realistically, me not having any interaction with that till Friday doesn't really work. So I need to know, is that email actually relevant? I have to deal with it before Friday or not. So I do check my PCN emails throughout the week. What I do, though, is exactly what you said. Those ones where I know I need to spend a bit more time formulating, looking at it, if it's an article I have to read in depth or or that kind of stuff, I will save it for later to deal with on the Friday where I've got my dedicated time to do so. Whereas during the week, week itself... I just deal with the quick, easy ones, so then I don't have to deal with that on the Friday. So Friday is then purely focused work around PCNs. That's a great idea. So my PCN day is Friday as well. So <laughs> I tend to operate in a very similar way yeah. uh, to, to yourself. Um, yeah. So um, and also in these in these getting to done systems, um, people can often get quite uh, have quite um, complicated approaches to um, tagging emails Mm -hmm. um, you know filing emails in folders for future reference Mm -hmm. and so forth Uh, so some people are quite big on that Um, a lot of people will just you know archive and forget and Mm -hmm. use use the search function to find things um, and be sort of disorganized knowing they can search yeah Um, uh, I know that I'm an archive and search person I used to be a folder person but it's difficult to maintain that over a period of time search is so good now How about yourself? And similar to yourself, so I used to try the principles of Inbox Zero, and I used to find I spent so much time tagging and, and allocating and moving emails and stuff. It was just like it was becoming less and less productive. And, be- and it's like you said, the key change to this has been the fact that search has become so much more effective. So, you know, if you use Google um, Mail for your inbox provider or even, you know, Outlook and that kind of stuff, now they can search within the text of the emails themselves to find relevant words and that kind of stuff, and whereas before they probably couldn't. Yeah. So that's just made things a lot easier. So then you can just type in something and find the relevant email straight away rather than having to look for it. And because of that, I've stopped doing the whole stick into files and folders and that kind of stuff. Uh, for certain things, I'll still do that. For yep. relevant documents, if I know I want to keep those, I'll send those to a particular folder so I know it's in that yep. particular folder whenever I want to find it. Um, and I even have a delete folder now, mm. for, so a daily delete folder that things I just need to keep for a very short space of time, and then every day I just delete it because I know I'm not going to need it again. Um, very similar principle I use with my editing, actually, for, mm-hmm. for videos and stuff as well, having that kind of media that, you know, I just can just get rid of it when I don't want it. Yeah, it's like the Windows trash can, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, It's deleted, but it's not until you take the extra decision to actually definitely. delete it. Um, so that's interesting. Yeah, I'm definitely an archive and search person yeah. now. Um, uh, so another area that I think it's worth touching on and... Um, and, and just if guys, people want to have a look at some more ideas and, and a better explanation of this kind of thing, check out our video on productivity. So we'll put the links and stuff down below and you'll probably see something spring across with the web link and stuff. But yeah, uh, have a look at that, guys. Um, it'll give you a bit more detail in terms of how to do some of these principles as well. That's my favourite um, tip Thursday that Gandhi ever did. <laughs> I, I love that productivity one. Definitely. Uh, so that's a hot tip. Check it out, guys. So uh, etiquette. Okay. Yeah. Email etiquette. So there's quite a lot written about email mm. etiquette out there. And um, I guess uh, in this section, we've sort of distilled it down to what we felt were the more important ones. And um, definitely things I think, you know, particularly clinicians, or primary care, GP, that kind of stuff that you need to be aware of. Um, I, I guess the first one that we've talked about quite a lot is, first of all, should you reply by email in the first place? Yeah, or should it have been an email Agreed. in the first yeah. place? Because uh, often you're receiving these things and you think... Ah, Maybe you could have picked up the telephone. Mm. Um, maybe you could have got out of your room and walked around to yeah. my room uh, and asked me this question. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I think when people are writing emails, mm. I think, and if you're writing an email, it's worth just thinking, is this the correct medium? Yeah. It's the easiest often, just to mm. fire an email, and it feels like you've done something productive. Mm. But um, are you? is that the best way to achieve? Definitely agree with that. want. Yeah, so um, I mentioned earlier about using email as a discussion forum. Mm. Uh, My personal view is that should not happen. So if it's something that requires multiple viewpoints of various different people um, and actually requires some thinking time as well, that's realistically a meeting. 
It's a meeting that needs planning, you know, and how to do yep. a meeting effectively is a completely separate topic that we will probably cover at some point in the future. Um, but yep. definitely that's not something you should be dealing with by email. No matter how the time pressures may work. And this is the yep. thing. is It's not just the ease of sending an email. It's the time pressure of having a decision within... Unfortunately, as the NHS tends to dictate to us, a few microseconds of time. Um, but, you know, making sure you're discussing in the right way is highly important. Yeah. And I think people are most guilty of uh, saying an email when they could have had a face-to-face or telephone conversation. Mm. Uh, I think that's where people where this breaks down for most people. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, meetings, I think we have a lot of those and they occur, but it's it's where... This could have been a real-time conversation that definitely. would have saved us both a lot of time and not sent us an email. And definitely the one-on-one situation, I would highly recommend that. Actually, if this is something that requires a bit of back and forth, don't do it by email. Yeah. You know, either find a way of automating it. So one of my favorite ones is organizing meetings. Mm. I now use a product that basically lets me do that without the negotiation and time. So I've yeah. automated that principle using things like Calendly and stuff. Um, but if it's an actual discussion pick up the phone and yeah. speak to them is so much easier. So we talked about, should it be an email at all? Yeah. So once we've decided it is an email, um, who should be in on the email? I think that's something people get get wrong oh, yes. as well. So um, first and foremost, reply all is the worst button you should ever press. That's my personal view. I agree. And I do it sometimes, I think by mistake, or I sometimes yeah. think it's the right thing. And then um, you notice that... Um, so then, the problem it floods everybody's inbox. It with does. Them. Oh, yeah, doesn't I it? can make the meeting, and yeah. they're not the organisers of the meeting. No, they don't care. I don't care if you can make the meeting necessarily. The mm. person organising the meeting needs to know. Yeah, and then Gandhi, what happens is um, automatic reply. Mm. Uh, this person is away on annual leave, and everybody starts to get those messages. Yeah, um, because they're replying all to your reply all, yep. and gosh, you can yeah, it can cause lots of problems. And this happened about two years ago in the NHS oh, yes. email system. And and basically, what, so it was, I can't remember what the actual original email was, but it was a, an email that was sent by mistake yeah. and it ended up going to everybody on NHS.net. <laughs> and as a result... I've remembered this now. It's yeah. hilarious. And as a result, loads of people started replying, this is not relevant to me. Please remove me from the email train. However, they did exactly what Andy and I have just said yeah. you should never do. They clicked reply all and it just snowballed. Yeah. I think someone sent an email to everyone in the NHS or something. Yeah. And then everybody was replying all to everybody else within the NHS. The NHS, I think, is the for our global viewers, is, yeah. I think, is it the third largest employer in the world. Yeah. Well, They're, it's now um, fifth, but yeah, fifth, still okay. you know, biggest in Europe and fifth largest employer in the world. So you can imagine the number of emails this generated. And again, like you said, the automated replies, it just went chaotic and the servers crashed, effectively. It stopped <laughs> NHS.net for about a day or so they just yeah. couldn't because and then the problem was people kept replying to the reply yeah. and it was just like remove me from hard, hard to hard to chaos stop. so move away from reply or really think about do i need to press that or does it need to be a single reply or does it even need to be a dedicated reply yeah but best of yet does it need to be a reply in the first place and uh, you know i still i still get a little bit confused about the etiquette around carbon copy mm. blind carbon copy should I be one of the main recipients? Should I be in CC? If I mean, mm. if someone CC'd me, what does that mean? Okay. Um, explain to me, okay. Gandhi. So uh, the the person you're sending the email to, that should be the primary person that you're sending it to or mm. people. So these are the decision makers. These are the people that have a direct impact on whatever it is you're sending. They should go in the main you know, subject yeah. kind of area. The CC section should be simply the people that kind of need to know about this but don't really need to respond or don't really need to have interaction with the content. So, you know, for example, in our PCN stuff, Mm. again, um, a a direct email could probably be between myself and my other clinical directors. And I may CC in the other board members to say that this is just for your information to know Mm. what we're doing. And I don't expect them to reply. And the other thing I'll probably say is make that clear in the email as well if you're setting up this system for the first few times. Um, And then that just means that people have the relevant information that they need, but only the people that have to reply do reply and that kind of thing. BCC, I get a bit more confused with that. So blind carbon copy. So this is where you put somebody's email address in, but nobody else knows that you've done it. I find that a little bit dubious because it kind of raises the question, why are you doing that? It's a distribution list, isn't it? Yeah. It's where you don't want... The, it's where it's important that the other recipients of the email mm. do not know everybody else's email. 
Is no, yeah, I, I can get that. So, it's, so particularly GDPR and that kind of stuff. Yeah. But I think, yeah, th- this should be only things that are sent from central repositories. Yeah. But more importantly, sent with the view that you're not replying. No. This is the key thing. Yeah. It's for information, isn't it? Yes. So I think there are a few kind of um, lists around not again, which is, oh, there are some locum sessions available and they send it to all the locums. Mm. You don't want all the locums to know all the other locums' email addresses or set up these yeah, cascading reply all situations. Mm. So I think that's where I think BCC's probably most relevant but for, for most of us not running those sorts of lists mm-hmm. probably something that we don't need to to do Fair I, enough. I think um yeah which uh brings me on to using the subject say something i really appreciate mm-hmm. when i you receive an email is if the person has done a few things if they've thought about how they're actually using the medium mm-hmm. so uh, if they've made good use of the subject line yep if it's clear what the email is about mm-hmm. um, and then i can decide whether to read the email or not it saves me a lot of time i could decide sometimes based on the subject line that i don't need to read this email now yep. and i can ignore it um it's useful if they indicate whether they want an action mm-hmm. in the subject line or whether it's for information again that just helps me prioritize it it's something that i've started to try and do now i'm sending emails out mm-hmm. uh, to you know a group of people in a primary care network um and also those first two lines of the email i find are quite useful as well because yeah. in a lot of the places where you're reading email you can see the first you know line or two mm-hmm. as a summary when you're looking at it so it's helpful if you, you know you can think about those first two lines and use that to convey the urgency or importance yeah. and give people a gist as to whether they really need to engage with it or not or whether it's one of those optional Sure. Of emails. And, and I'd probably take that further and add that into the subject line, actually. So, uh, you yeah. know, one of the things that we do in our practice is if uh, our practice manager needs us to respond to mm. something by a certain time frame, she will put that in the subject line. Yes. So, you know, reply by the 28th of November. Um, that tells me I have to deal with this by that date. Now, if it's the 1st of November, okay, not so urgent, maybe. Probably mm. didn't need to be dealt with that way. However, clearly, if this is the 27th of November, I've only got a 24-hour period to deal with whatever yeah. that is. So I know that's a priority. I either have to look at it or deal with it before it gets to tomorrow. Otherwise, I'm going to miss the boat. And you know, yeah. it comes down as well to the sensibility of the person who's sending it in the first place. But that's where you know your culture, your organization rules and stuff has a huge impact. But using that kind of format, and like you said, yeah. for your information only in the yeah. subject line, um, reply by you know yeah, that kind of for action action needed yeah. that kind of thing those kind of stuff in the subject line just brings in project management aspects to email use that makes it more effective and useful to the person that's receiving it and then also to the person who needs the response because you're not yeah. burying that response somewhere in the email for them to miss I agree <laughs> preaching to the choir <laughs> okay so uh, yeah and uh, so again what about using templates and you know mm. and your signature at the bottom can, can those help us in any in any I, way i think they're a massive way to save you time so there are inevitably some emails where you end up writing virtually the same thing over and over and over again and this can be a variety of different things that you may do um i know with my egp learning stuff there's some templated replies that i'll give to people often or my tagline for example i've got mm. that saved in a system that i can just copy and paste quickly and stick that in i've got you know google drive sorry gmail uses canned replies as a way of trying mm-hmm. to do that so if you want we'll stick a video in it explains how to do that but it's so that you can actually have set text that you can just um literally with a couple of clicks add that in um and that makes your time more effective signature in terms of contact it's a great way of saying to people this is how i do things mm. this is the times that i will look at my email mm. that's a great thing to put in your signature these are my declarations of interest or other ways to contact me for various things so my signature has things like the pod blast it has my twitter mm. handle all that kind of stuff if people want to and prefer to contact me by that but it also has my candy link to book a phone call with me so if you actually want to speak mm. to me it's there black and white in my signature this is how you speak to me and it's done on a time frame that works for me so that I know is not going to be a problem. I've already said that. Um, so having those kind of systems in place. And the providers are getting better at this as well. So Google now even has a system that tries to predict your response as you type it. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen yeah. that in action. It's actually, useful. it's not too bad. Generally, it, it does shave off a few seconds. Yeah, and actually they have that system where it suggests a reply to the email, mm-hmm. which I've used um on a number of occasions so yeah. it's not part of the client I currently use 
but it, it sort of anticipates it's a meeting. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, oh, yeah, okay, I can make it on the whatever date. Yeah. Um, and that can save a lot of time, one click responses. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, cool. So, etiquette, etiquette, very important. One of those things where um, we wish everybody else, uh, do, if everyone practices what they preach, is mm -hmm. then. Um, then it's uh, it gets into a better place, but it's, it depends on everybody following the rules. I guess, it does, which is yeah. difficult, but we should all set an example, and maybe other people will follow. Definitely, and a couple of those ones that are very personal to me that mean yeah. a huge amount. So number one, font that you use in emails. <laughs> Please use an easy to read font. The default ones that come with most of them are yep. generally fine. Yep. Don't start using weird and fancy fonts just because you think it looks pretty. Because yeah. if it makes the readability of the content harder, you're less likely to get engagement. So anything with lots of curves and you know yeah. serif kind of fonts and that kind yeah. of stuff, avoid. So my favorite font is Comic Sans. I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> I hate you with a passion. I really don't like it. I, yeah, no. Yeah, I like um, Arial Helvetica. Yeah. Good. Or Roboto is my personal favourite. I'm a Google know, man. Why would you change from the from the default font? I guess some people must so have a reason. I go on the basis that Google has an obscene amount of money and they spend a lot of time researching the best and easiest to read font and they believe that to be Roboto. So, yeah, that's the simple reason why. Um, Fair enough. And then the last one is confidentiality. As much as we would love to think that emails are confidential, um, they're not. Um, so please remember that. You should not be conveying information. You shouldn't be. Clearly, patient identifiable information, all yep. that kind of stuff. Yes, NHS.net is more secure, and it shouldn't really be leakable from that. But don't forget, technically, nothing. Once it's in a digital well, format, can be tracked, can be it, traced. It's not, it's not hackable, yeah. well, or less hackable. Yeah. Uh, but you're still sending this information to other humans who may not be supposed to see it yeah. um, based on using information for the purpose in which it's exactly. you know, stored and so forth. Um, so yeah, very important. And the other thing with etiquette, as alluded to earlier mm. in the podcast, um, just try not to offend people. Yeah. Try and steer clear of controversial statements or those sorts of conversations that are maybe about blame or accountability yeah. or singling people out. I've seen these things happen on email. Uh, and it always goes wrong for individuals and organisations. So yep. um, just think about whether yeah, it should be in an email and yeah. who should be receiving it. Definitely. Um, that's good. Something like, Gaddy, what do you think about emojis in email? So this is mm -hmm. something which uh, can help diffuse situations, can help with some of that kind of nuanced, mm -hmm. you know, body language, tone of voice isn't there. Yeah. But it can look a bit unprofessional. So I use emojis in my personal kind of yeah. emails and WhatsApp and so forth. Mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't use them in professional emails, but maybe they have, they have a role or in the future. What, what, what do you think? Um, I would only use them, and I do use them occasionally in professional emails, but yeah. only people that I've already met. So, so that's my rule of using emojis yeah. and stuff. It's with people that I know who already know me. So they kind of know my character. They know the way that I talk and that kind of stuff. As a fresh off the bat or talking to a room of people, I have no idea who they are. Yeah, it's probably not the best way to interact with them because, it, like you said, it doesn't look professional as such. Mm. But you're also correct in the fact they're a great way of trying to diffuse and convey tone mm. um, and they can just lighten the load. It's also, depending on which emoji you're using, clearly the poo emoji, I would imagine, should never really be in a professional email yeah. unless you are truly trying to make a bold and outlandish <laughs> statement. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Emoji, yeah, I think in a few years, I think maybe they'll be creeping more and more. Definitely. more professional. And, and we're seeing that, you know, a lot of the email providers now actually have emojis that you can send in the content of the emails themselves. Yeah. You know, mail providers actually have them as the subject line. You can stick them in. So yeah. I, I use MailChimp to send a lot of my EGP learning emails out. And, you know, they actually recommend sticking emojis in the subject title because you get better pick up rate from people because they're more interested to see what it's about. Mm. Good tip. Mm. So, Gandhi, we identified that just the volume of yeah. email uh, can be a problem. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any tips um, to help us with this? So definitely one thing that I think everyone should be doing is unsubscribing from the numerous emails you've probably yeah. signed up to over the years and you don't really do much about them. And, and, and this can change. You know, you go through different cycles in your life where something interests you or you want to get information about something. But then, you know, a few months, a couple of years down the line, actually, yeah. you, your needs have shifted. You don't really need that. So unsubscribing to content that you don't really want. What's the point in getting it? Because you're still having to deal with it. And if it is an email that, you know, almost every week you're just going, delete, delete. Yeah. Why are you getting that in the first place? Just unsubscribe from that list. 
nice and easy. Flip side of it is make sure you're getting the emails you do want. So That's what true. we call whitelisting content that you're getting. So this may be, um, you know, again, to topics that, you know, from mail lists and that kind of stuff that you want to read. Um, but more importantly, from people outside of your organizations in particular. Um, so they may unfortunately end up in your junk box and you yeah. don't check until, you know, once a month or something like that to see what's in there. And actually see, oh, that's a really important email. I needed mm. to see that make sure you whitelist it. So that can be simply adding them to your content. Yeah, that, that seems to work for most systems, yeah. doesn't it? Just add them to your contacts. Yeah. yeah. And if not, uh, we'll, again, we'll stick a link in the show notes that shows you how to whitelist emails and stuff to make sure you get things. So definitely whitelist those from EGP Learning, you guys. Absolutely, it, yeah. yeah. Improves the deliverability and means that you actually get all the content. Initially, there was a period when they went in my junk box. Um, yeah. And I, and Me and I, I had to, talked I, about this quite often because I, had to, I, had I to, know when he opens I my emails. To, I had to whitelist them. Yes. Um, excellent. Um, I suppose another thing to deal with um, overload, not so much volume, but overload mm. is just think about these, you know, do not disturb functions that you can get on, you know, on a lot of devices now mm. um, because uh, that can avoid, you know, if Gandhi's colleague... Uh, had that installed on his or her uh, device, then they wouldn't have received that one one a.m. email at one yeah. a.m. Uh, and you know they wouldn't have been bothered by that. But then they wouldn't have had the productive conversation that led to Gandhi not sending emails at yeah. one a.m. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> So next, I guess, is the types of tools that we want to use, and there's various different types of tools that you could think about using. <sighs> there, I mean, there's an enormous yes. array. Um, shall we talk about what? what we use yeah, ourselves. Sure. Um, oh, first point to make before that. So I am I have been and I'm guilty about sometimes obsessing about the tools yeah. and not doing the work. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are like this. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the tools are important. It's important to choose them wisely, mm -hmm. you know, things that you can work with. Uh, but equally, uh, don't change too often. Yeah. Don't get some people try and get the, the perfect solution to yeah. managing their email. And while they're spending time doing that, they're, they're not doing their email. So well, yeah, it's because it takes time to set up, time to yeah. use effectively, and, and that's work that's may may not be actually productive in the long run. Yeah. Um. You know, there are loads of systems out there. There's tons of free ones. There's some paid ones, and some people would say, "Why would I ever pay for a system?" Well, actually, if it has a, a function that speaks to you massively in terms of the way that you use it, so predictive technology, if it has certain functions like blocking out emails more effectively, or it's just quicker. So there are a couple of really speedy email clients out there that do cost a little bit to use. Some people, that shaves seconds off their time, but those seconds add up to minutes, add up to hours. So mm. it's about what works best for you. We're going to cover ours. Yep. So, so what's yours, Andy? What's mine? So I've moved around a bit over the years, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm actually probably most happy with the current email setup that I mm -hmm. have before. Um, and I've used, um, you know, some of your more obscure email things in the past, mm -hmm. like the Inbox app, Spark, um, you know, a number of the other ones. Uh, but since becoming a primary care network director, mm -hmm. email went up. And actually, I've just gone to Microsoft Outlook, mm -hmm. which feels really plain and vanilla. But mm -hmm. actually, it's quite a good product. The yeah. reason why was um, I found that I had too many places that email was coming in mm -hmm. from me yeah, you know i've got a few email addresses that i use for different purposes I've got ncgpa role uh primary care clinical director role using my nhs email mm -hmm. my personal gmail and actually a few others and outlook actually enables you to bring all of those in one yeah. place um so you can view them as just one combined inbox or separate them out yep. and you can use them one place one device tackle your email all at once and that's actually working for me now better than probably any other solution that yep. i've had uh, before it's also integrated with um, Outlook Calendar, which mm -hmm. actually a lot of people use in the NHS when they're sending invites, and those invites are compatible with other types of calendars. Yeah. But it just seems to be better to be on that platform. And actually, that's working well for me. Mm -hmm. The device I use um, is uh, I use obviously desktop. Uh, I use uh, iPad mm -hmm. and iPhone as well. And I suppose in the mornings, I do do it in the morning, Andy, I'm afraid, mm -hmm. uh, when I'm doing my emails, I will sit with uh, the iPad, almost the perfect email device now for mm -hmm. me, because uh, I can fire up Outlook, uh, you can swipe left or right to quickly deal with things yeah. that you know you don't need to deal with using the, um, looking at the subject line, mm -hmm. um, got a keyboard, I can type replies, um, with iPad OS, you mm -hmm. can... Um, send your attachments to your OneDrive and put them in OneDrive folders. So it's almost become 
you know, almost the perfect email device for me. And I'm probably having more success with email now than I have sure. in the past. That's my setup, Gandhi. Okay. Um, so Yourself? I completely agree oh. with everything you've said, although I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the reason why I don't do that, and um, there's two reasons. So number one, I, I'm not as much of a fan of Outlook because I find the, the interface a little bit gray and vanilla. And I know that you also use Microsoft Office Suite. So a lot of your stuff integrates quite well with that. Now, I don't use that. Yeah. So that's why, one, I guess, one of the main reasons I don't use Outlook as much. Um, my main email client is Gmail. Um, so Google Man, as many people know, I like the way it all integrates and flows and is accessible wherever I want to be. Um, and Google is generally pretty safe and secure and that kind of stuff. So, And I use Google Docs and Sheets and all that kind of stuff as well. Mm. So it sit, sits with the, in the system I like to use. Um, and all my email accounts, bar one, are through Gmail. The one that isn't yep. is my NHS.net account. And the reason yep. for that is when you sign up to an email client provider with an NHS.net account, it has this tiny little thing that pops up when you do it that says that in circumstances, this will make your device wipeable if it gets lost or something like that. Yep. And that makes me slightly anxious, the fact that my device is now no longer mine. Um, so that reason I don't use Google, because if you try and do that with Gmail, if you try and do that with Outlook, it mm. gives you that notification. So for my NHS.net, for my mobile device, I use something called Blue Mail, mm -hmm. which does everything Gmail does. And actually, I'd probably say Gmail's taken on some of Blue Mail's content, like the snooze later kind of yeah. function that you mentioned. Actually, Blue Mail have been doing that for ages, and Gmail's only just taken that on in the past six months or so. Yeah, um, limited functionality in Outlook. You've got a bit of that now. Yeah. Carry on, Gary. But the benefit of using Blue Mail is it won't wipe your device from integrating with NHS.net. It just works. And I don't know why, and I don't know how. I've got it's, it's something to do with the server way that it accesses the emails. It's still IMAP, so if I delete something on my device, it deletes it properly. It's not POP, which is the other way where it, every device is a bit different. Um, so it works, and it just flows, and I love it, and it makes my life easier. And the other thing is I now have a dedicated email app that's just for my PC and stuff. So I mentioned earlier that throughout the week I will dip into my emails to see which yeah. ones are relevant. And when I do that, I do that on my mobile because I have the snooze function later and it's, like you said, it's the physical interface rather than it's the... It's so much quicker than, yeah. clicking, than clicking delete. You can just exactly. swipe. Love it. But when I'm doing my more dedicated email stuff, when I'm sitting down to do those more complicated replies, my Surface, hands down. I want my device, I want my proper keyboard, I want my bigger screen. Um, so for me, it's either the Surface or if I'm at my workplace, I'll use the desktop where I've got my double screens and stuff. Yeah. So I'm more productive. And that's when I'll have my full 25 minutes, get through them as quick as possible, make sure I've got everything there and it's done. And that's my system and that works pretty well for me right now. I tend to do the emails later on mm. the day. So I tend to have one locked where I'm doing it about 11, 12 o'clock just before lunchtime. So I've got that yep. carrot of food afterwards yeah. to get me, me through it. Um, and then I tend to do another slot later on in the day just before the close, so around about four or five o'clock. Yeah. When I'm in practice, big thing, I don't open any of my email clients whilst I'm at work. Yeah. So... Another question. So these, so mm. your device has all sorts of different settings for notifications. Yes. So it can pop up every time you get an email, or you can yeah. switch notifications completely mm. off. Mm. Um, what's your attitude towards notifications? So I would always say reduce your notifications as much as possible. My personal email address has notify at any time because that's my personal one, and I, I don't give that to many people at all. That's literally family, friends, and, and important things that I know I need to reply to ASAP. My work-based one, so my PCM one, pings off around about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Mm. And that's the only time I'll get a notification of how many emails I've got. So that fits just before my last intake of when I need to do things. And then I'll have a quick look and I'll see how many are there and then I can go through it. And that's why whenever I do get to it, there's normally about 15, 20 emails I need to bosh through. Mm. Um, and I'll do that quickly and snooze all of them to Friday, the ones that I need to have a proper reply on. Or if it's something that's urgent, I'll say, I'll get to this on Friday. Or if it's really, really urgent, fair enough, I'll do it then. You see, I, I wish I could give that answer because that, that's the correct answer. I'd love to say, oh, I've, you know, I've switched notifications off, but uh, but I haven't. I have the thing where it, it pops up, you know, they collect on your screen. Yeah. Um, and then when you take your phone out of your pocket for whatever reason, mm. um, you can see it. And I think part of that is probably just that, you know, fear of missing out or mm. that anxiety that something might be going on that I need to know about. Um and, 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 and I'd be able to see it because I can, you know, it, mm. it, they're collecting on my home screen. Um, but 
that's probably not the right way to do it. I think it comes down to your own anxieties and the way that you use it, isn't it? I'm trying to make sure that I'm more disciplined about Mm. how I approach these things. And and this whole concept of batching, I really think, does make a noticeable difference to the way that you can not only be productive and effective... But keeping sane. Yeah. Oh, I won't, I won't respond to them yeah. uh, when I when I see them coming up. Then you know, I'll still I'll deal with them later. Yeah. Um, it's just you know, I can see them just in case one of them happens to be really um, urgent. But mm-hmm. you know, if it was urgent, they'd ring me. And if I'm going to deal with them later, why am I having them pop up as notifications? Yeah. I should probably change my behaviour. And that time well. distraction, although it may only yeah. be a few seconds, it's this constant principle I keep coming mm-hmm. back to to people. Few seconds, multiple times a day, makes minutes. Those minutes make hours. That's time you don't get back. Yeah, and change, and and there's a lot of evidence that changing, uh, switching tasks and thinking about different things mm. uh, is actually more disruptive to your productivity than than just the time looking yeah. at it as well. Um, so I should probably, you know, preach that along with you and practice. We it shall too. see. Cool. Um, Extra little habits. So one habit I try and recommend to everyone is make sure you go through the principle of email audits. Now, I know everybody out there is now thinking, Gandhi, why on earth are you talking about audits? We hate audits. Yeah. But actually, there's a good reason. So every few months or so, I will sit down for about 15, 20 minutes and just literally scan my emails and think, do I still need to get this one? You know, it's having a dedicated time. Not frequently, um, but just to review, do I still need to do this? So I, I mentioned to Andy before we started this, I did that for my Dropbox account. Mm. So I, I, I use that to store various different things. It's coming up to being full. So I got a notification about that and I just sat down 15 minutes and deleted all the stuff I hadn't looked at for about two years. Mm. Automatically cleaned off about 30%. Yeah, dead easy. Yeah. I, if I've not looked at it for that length of time, or it's not one of the folders that I know I want to keep stuff in forever, I don't need it. Dead easy. Um, that makes sense and it's the same principle with emails so we talked about unsubscribing from lists you know if it, you've got those yeah. emails just do it call them get rid of them you know, you're not looking at them so what's the point point? Um, and, and having those kind of principles of what am I looking at and storing that makes a lot of sense so uh, if there are any appraisers out there let us know whether this uh, email audit would be acceptable uh, at a GP appraisal productivity <laughs> and self resilience I would argue to any appraiser it's a great functional way of trying to keep you more productive and effective so you can manage your workflow and you can clearly do this with anything it'd be an interesting little audit to put on, on the it appraisal would, it? Yeah. Uh, probably not the main one no. um, excellent so um, we covered these before but important things just to think about as a clinician mm-hmm. just to make sure that we've covered it um, use the right platform for the sort of email you're sending yeah. so professional email that particularly that involves any sensitive or clinical information, then mm. in the UK, you're going to be using your NHS.net mm. email account because you have to. Um, and I'm sure other health services around the world have important uh, rules about information governance. So just make sure you're following that. And also secure your device as well. Um, you know, these systems are only as secure as the device that you use and the strength of the password that you mm. are using. Those human factors are important. So just make sure that you do that or the NHS may wipe your device. Definitely. Unless you're using Blue Mail, in which yeah. case you can escape. Um, excellent. But it's, it's definitely an important area. You know, and make sure you're using the right email address for the right reason. I remember yeah. having somebody apply for a job. Now, this isn't the email address <laughs> they use, but it's very similar. Sexy hot doctor for applying for their job, whilst I can see some places they may want to think a bit more about that. I yeah. think it's not really the most professional kind of email address I would want to use to somebody when we're talking about working in a clinical environment, etc. Did they et get the job? Uh, no. No. Okay. That's fine. For other reasons, though, not so, just because of the email. Doctor need not apply. No. <laughs> um, so, so Gandhi, email, powerful tool. Yeah. Lots of problems. Yeah. Um, sounds like, actually... A lot of efforts required to keep it controllable. Um, Definitely, people have tried to create alternatives to mm-hmm. email, other platforms. Uh, I've seen a lot of these over the years, and I know the two have tried to use these yeah. in certain organisations. Um, so people have been trying to make email better for a long mm-hmm. time. Um, why is it that you think we're all still using email and dealing with more email than we've ever dealt with? in the past I think there's a few reasons so number one first of all people always go to the easiest system for them to use and email is still one of the easiest systems to use because it's simply put somebody's name in it and write a message you can't get much simpler than that 
Um, number two, we do have the issue of um, governance when it comes to systems that we can use in our field as primary care clinicians and stuff. So it has to be secure enough. And at the moment, there's only two systems that actually are effective for that. So NHS.net and Office.com are the only two systems that you can use, for example, for sending emails to patients. Um, when we're talking about other kind of systems, so you know, we're talking about things like, I guess, Slack, Asana, yeah. you know, WhatsApp. They have governance issues that mean they may or may not be applicable to use. But at the same time, you know, it's that extra functionality they bring versus the safety is always that extra question that people have. Yeah. And the complexity or perceived complexity yeah. of use, because it can be difficult to persuade colleagues to move on to these platforms. And mm-hmm. I think I think this is why email just won't go away. It's yeah. a bit why Facebook may be unassailable. Mm-hmm. Um, they just email uh, is it just has a critical mass of people now who yeah. know how to use it. Uh, and everybody is on email, knows how to use email. Email's open source as well. So no mm. one really owns email. Yeah. So you don't have these issues of being you know, locked into certain platforms or having to pay to use email. It's mm. just universal. Everybody uses it, knows how to use it, and it's free. Yeah. And I think that's why it's probably here to stay. Yeah. But that doesn't mean we can't use it better. Absolutely. So... And we've talked so much in this episode about how to use it better. My life would be a lot better if I practiced what we've talked about here Mm -hmm. and if everybody else did. So um, hopefully people have listened, learned some uh, lessons. Hopefully those people in my own organisation have also (laughs) listened. Definitely. Um, and we can all be more productive together. Especially those people in the NHS that send us all those lovely emails on a Friday evening at five o'clock in the evening. Not going to get a reply, I'm afraid. Yeah. So, uh, so, right, so that was fun, Gandhi. Um, thanks for listening, guys out there. Oh, mm. final question. So, Gandhi, you hated email. Do you still hate email after that conversation? Um, yes, simply put. Yeah. But I, I'm more optimistic, hopefully, about people using it more effectively now. So that may help to reduce my hate of it. Yeah. I don't know. We'll see. I, I hate it, but I think I've learned how to deal with it a little bit better. It's one of those hates that you kind of have to live with. Absolutely. Like family. <laughs> <laughs> and friends yeah. <laughs> and colleagues so yeah so thanks for listening um, as always yeah as always guys make sure you subscribe comment share whatever you want to do with our content we would love it if you contact us and tell us what you think of this episode we've enjoyed making this yeah. one actually we, we've been working towards this one for a while and we'd love to hear what you think do you think what we've talked about is useful to you are you going to take on some of those things if you are send us a comment we'd love to hear that and stick it in the notes below as always, we'd love reviews, you know, hearing about whether you think this format is good, not good, what we're doing well, what we're not doing so well, that kind of stuff. Love to hear from you guys. And please make sure you subscribe to get all of this stuff. So we've got loads of really cool things coming for you guys shortly. I agree. You've said it all. So it's <laughs> goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. And we'll see you guys later. Catch you next episode. So, EGP learners, just to let you know, there is a certificate of engagement for you waiting in the show notes. Click on it, and as part of your appraisal, you'll get that information so you can stick it in your appraisal, get all the points. Catch you soon.